Sooners of the University of Oklahoma are synonymous with football power. The only team to rank in the top 10 for 10 consecutive years, the Sooners hold the all-time record of 47 straight victories without a loss. They scored in more than 100 consecutive games. Coach Bud Wilkinson is one of the acknowledged masters of offensive football. With assistant Gomer Jones, he's taught many a boy to be an effective running back. Here is Coach Wilkinson. To begin with, a back has to have a well-balanced stance, so you can move straight ahead as fast as a sprinter, but still move laterally with reasonable effectiveness. Your feet should be as wide apart as your shoulders, with one drop back to the heel of the other. Your back is parallel to the ground. Head and eyes are up. One arm carries your weight. The other is relaxed across the leg so that your shoulders are square with the line of scrimmage. At Oklahoma, we use a stance with a good bit of weight forward, so our backs can almost explode into motion at full speed. In starting properly, you should drive off the back foot, pumping your arms in the full sprinting motion. In a lateral start, it's easy to go in the direction of the rear foot. You drive off the forward foot, throwing your entire weight in the direction you're going. Moving to the side of the forward foot requires a slight push with the hand to get your weight on both feet. If you play a position where you start laterally most of the time, you should have your weight perfectly balanced so you can step out in either direction. Your feet are almost on the same line, so you're not handicapped moving to either side. On the counter start, your first step should be a real one, not half-hearted. Then the second step is exactly toward the hole so that you do not cross your feet. In preparing to take the ball on a handoff, your arms must open up to form a pocket. If your elbow is down, it blocks the ball. If your far hand is too far back, the ball goes through. The same thing happens if it's too far forward. If both hands are in proper position, there's a beautiful pocket and a good target for the quarterback. The opening must be large enough for the ball to go through. The quarterback places it on your stomach. With both hands and arms in the correct positions, you have a proper pocket for the ball. Let's use a whole backfield to demonstrate the fundamentals we've talked about so far. Having gotten the ball, your next job is to hold on to it. The forward point should be covered with the palm of your hand. The other point is under your arm. If it's held properly, the ball can take a jolt from any angle and there's no danger of fumbling. If you expose either point, a blow on the ball makes you lose control and you do fumble. The hardest thing to remember is to get your hand over the forward point of the ball. At Oklahoma, we teach our backs not to shift the ball once they have it firmly under control. Here's a game action shot of what can happen when you try to get fancy and move the ball to your other arm. One of the back's most important jobs is faking possession of the ball when he actually doesn't receive it. You must leave the same open target as before so the quarterback can place the ball on your stomach. Your arms should remain in position as you carry out the fake. As you ride over the ball, your far arm comes all the way across to grab the opposite elbow. Arms should drop straight down from the shoulder, leaving a pocket that could contain the ball. Most backs feel that if they fake up to the line of scrimmage, they've done a good job. Actually, the defense is not concerned if you stop faking and they know the ball is still behind the line of scrimmage. It's when you move past the line that they have to go for your fake.
the effective fake area is from the line of scrimmage seven or eight yards downfield. When you drop your fake too soon, the defense gets a clear shot at the ball carrier. When taking a pitch out, your hands should never be on top of the ball. Wrong hand position and taking your eyes off the ball cause most of the fumbles on pitch outs. Your hands should be underneath and behind the ball. In practice, we put numbers on our balls. The back has to read out the number as he looks the ball into his hands. Here's another thing we do regularly at Oklahoma. Ice cold Coca-Cola is given to our players immediately after every practice session and at halftime during ball games. Football is a demanding game. After our players have gone full speed for several minutes, they're quite tired. We've found that ice cold Coke provides just the right amount of refreshment and quick energy. Our players like the idea too. Learning how to follow his blocking is one of a back's most important responsibilities. It takes practice. You run to the side your blocker's head is on. You must get enough practice in taking the handoff to do it as a habit without looking at the ball so that when the play starts, you can do it naturally and automatically. In hitting into the line, the head of your blocker is the controlling factor as he will use his head to keep the defensive man to one side or the other. Follow the head. When running wide, you can aid your blocker by faking. The defensive man reacts to the course of the ball carrier, not the blocker. If you're going inside, fake wide, then duck inside. If you're going around, fake in, then duck out around. The defensive man will take the fake and get himself out of position which makes the blocker's job a lot easier. In a broken field, you should apply both principles. Try to set up the block with the fake, and remember to follow the blocker's head. Already going at full speed, a good back has a little extra at the crucial second. This is sometimes referred to as a change of pace. It's those little extras that make the good back great. Sometimes, for example, a zigzag saves the touchdown. When you're carrying the ball, you're slowed up because you can't have full running motion with both arms. When a pursuer gets close, you can stay ahead of him by changing direction. In practice, this drill is good fun. The chasing man will put on a burst of speed to catch you. If you change just before he reaches you, you can stay ahead of a man who may actually be able to run much faster. If a back runs in an erect position, he has all of his soft spots exposed, essentially his stomach. If you bend forward in what we call a hitting position, you expose a hard shelled surface to the tackler, helmet, shoulder pads, elbows, and knees. This is a drill we use to crystallize all the elements involved in being a good ball carrier. You must first be in a coiled position, all hard surfaces. You hold the ball properly with your head and eyes up so you can see the target at all times. You have excellent balance so that you can pivot and start rapidly in any direction. In football, you either do the hitting or you get hit. You should deliver a blow to the tackler instead of letting the tackler hit you. Above all, you have determination. Determination to stay on your feet and not be tackled. Football teaches you to fight through all opposition until you score. That's the true test of a good running back.
One of the most respected young coaches in football is Darrell Royal of Texas. After playing an All-American quarterback at Oklahoma, Royal served as assistant coach at three big colleges, then put in a year as a pro coach. He has had three college head coaching assignments, all of them successful. As a smart, aggressive teacher who believes in hard-nosed football, Royal has led Texas to new heights on the gridiron. Good tackling is a trademark of his teams. Here is Coach Royal. 75% of tackling is morale, desire, and courage. If a man likes to hit, the proper techniques can add the extra 25% to make a really effective tackler. We've all seen football games lost because of poor tackling like this. And slow motion shows why. Plenty of desire, but poor technique. You can waste a good offense if through poor tackling your defense has a hard time taking the ball away from the opposition. If you have a real hard tackling defensive football team, nobody's going to embarrass you. You're going to be in every game you play if you're hard to move the ball on. You must have courage, you must have desire and morale. These are basic qualities of an effective tackler. Technique can add the 25% effectiveness you need to win. And good tackling technique starts with a good base. Feet should be about shoulder width apart. A good wide base plus short choppy steps will keep you on good balance. As you are approaching the ball carrier, you don't want to overstride to take too long a step. If your feet are too close together, you don't have proper balance. A ball carrier is not going to run straight into you. He is going to be throwing fakes at you, faking one way and going another. If you don't have a proper base, you'll lose it. With your feet wide spread, knees bent, back straight and head up, you're in a hitting position. You can shift with the runner, and your solid base gives you a foundation for a driving tackle. You must have your head up in order to see the target that you are trying to tackle. Two, there is no way of having power unless your head is up. To keep the ball carrier from falling forward, you must hit on the rise, so to speak. Hit up in the numbers. Your head must be up so that you can follow through. Let's watch a heads-up tackle. One of the most common mistakes in tackling is putting your head down. You can't see your target, you have no driving power, and it stands to reason that your body is going straight into the ground. With your head down, you miss the tackle. If you tackle with your head and you should happen to be off target, you've got either shoulder to fall back on. Sometimes you get a bonus too. Your head's up, your headgear is placed squarely on the ball and the runner fumbles. This time he recovers, but not always. Locking your arms is an important part of a tackle. This is why they don't get away. Good contact, arms locked, and the runner goes down. You can get real fine contact and still not make the tackle. You can bounce him back and he might bounce back as far as two or three yards, maintain his balance and continue running. But if you lock your arms around him and then still have that same good contact and pull his body into yours, taking his legs away from him, that is when you have a good driving tackle. So far, we've covered three principles. Good base, head up, and arms locked. Now let's talk about follow through. The purpose of a good tackle is to stop the ball carrier in his tracks to even drive him backwards if possible. This depends on follow through with strong leg drive. When you don't follow through, the runner falls forward. 
In slow motion, it's easy to see what happens. Although you have good contact, your lack of follow through gives him extra yardage. Instead of being downed at this spot, the ball is grounded well upfield. This is giving away valuable yardage. If instead of chilling the ball carrier where you hit him, you allow him to fall forward, it costs you at least the length of his body. This much added yardage can give your opponent a first down. If you don't have follow through, the ball carrier will and he will fall forward. It's part of your job to eliminate this falling forward. Move your feet after you make contact. Chill him at the point of contact. A couple of actual game clips shows this technique in action. First, Texas against Alabama. Then from our game with Oklahoma. Good hot action in a game or on the practice field takes a lot of energy out of a player who's going all out. Ice cold Coca-Cola is the best thing we've found to get that energy back. That's why we give Coke to our players in the Texas dressing room. The coaches like to be refreshed too. We use an expression from boating to describe another element of tackling, going across the bow. Whenever you approach a ball carrier at an angle, you tackle with your head across and in front of the runner. This serves two purposes. First, it gives you a broader hitting surface, more power for the tackle. And secondly, it turns the runner into your teammates in case you don't make the tackle. You see, everyone's defensive secondary forms a cup or a perimeter. It tries at all times to keep the ball carrier turned back towards the inside and in front of them. When you tackle across the bow, you at least turn the runner inside. If you miss the tackle, your teammates then get a shot at him. Of course, if the first contact is properly made and the tackler goes across the bow, you can chill the runner without any additional help. But look what can happen if you miss. If you haven't turned the runner to the inside, he takes off into the wide open spaces and you've got a foot race. In slow motion, let's watch the outside man, the halfback, as he goes behind and puts his head behind the ball carrier. When he misses, it's just a foot race between the ball carrier and the safety man. There's no defensive perimeter here. When you tackle across the bow, turning the runner to the inside if you miss, it's sort of like shooting fish in a barrel. He can't get out of the barrel and your teammates just keep shooting until somebody gets him. Practice pays off in a game. This is the way we like to see a runner turn to the inside. This point is important enough to repeat. When you go across the bow with your head in front of the runner, you turn him inside if you miss. This allows your teammate to get a good shot at the runner. Finally, a word about gang tackling. We're opposed to piling on, but there's a big difference between that and gang tackling. When a ball carrier is still standing up, as long as the whistle is not blown and there is still a spot for you to put your headgear or shoulder pad in there, this is good, clean, hard, legal football. As long as a ball carrier is still standing up, a coach likes to see tacklers coming in from all angles. This is gang tackling.